Bring in the Capital. I'm Pamela Naff, and this is Carol Jackson III of American Filmmaker. Welcome to our program. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So last season, we talked a lot about should a filmmaker go to film school to learn the trade. And something we didn't think about and didn't talk about was a master's in film production, which you have. And I'd like to know a little bit about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, was a, it was a degree designed around uh, giving you the knowledge behind the scenes, right? Not so much in production. We did some production just to have a feel. And, and the theory was that if you actually, if you actually work on a production, you can gauge how much time something may take. So you, you, you'll be a better scheduling and, and you know, you'll know how many crew you really need and that sort of thing. But the bulk of it was really about um, uh, giving you kind of a, a behind the scenes knowledge, what types of things you want to think about, contracts and SAG and, and uh, uh, LLCs and all, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's pretty interesting. It was a pretty interesting program at American University. Would you credit that with your, like, People usually tend to focus, I'm a narrative filmmaker, I'm a documentarian, but you do both. Um, would you say that your degree played a role in that at all? Or? Well, I, I was doing both before the degree. Okay, got it. And um, I had made a, a, a few films before that, and the, the back end of filmmaking, which is now that you actually have a film made, how do you get people to see it, or distribution, those sorts of things, those sorts of things I kind of just stumbled through, right? So I, I, I really wasn't getting as much bang for my buck, so to speak, for, for the films that I, that I was making. So that's the reason I kind of decided that maybe I want to go into, or maybe I want to learn more about the production aspect, the things I should be doing beforehand to prepare for the film properly, and then the things that I need to, to be doing on the back end, and those sorts of things. You would learn that again on the, on the front end, so it, it kind of all kind of comes together. So how do you balance between narrative or documentary? What, how do you make those choices, what you're going to do? Um, sometimes it's about money, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. I, I kind of uh, started my career in the, in the, in the, uh, as a combat camera uh, for, the, for the military. And then also I moved, then I moved quickly into um, uh, uh, television news for a, a TV station in uh, Pennsylvania. So I really, like the beginning, the foundation of my skills are really like kind of backpack journalism stuff, right? So documentaries kind of fell neatly into that category because I can go out, I can backpack it, and I can get it done. Um, but at the end of the day, all films are kind of fiction films, narrative films, right? Mm -hmm. Because even in a, docu a documentary, you, you still pick and choose your truths, right? Mm -hmm. You pick and choose what you want to emphasize, what you don't want to emphasize, and you tailor your interviews, your experience, your, where you're going to go as opposed to where you're not going to go, all to fit into kind of a, a story that you're trying to, that you're trying to tell. So it, even though it's a documentary and we, we like to think it's, it's about what really happened, sometimes it's about how, how I want to tell you what happened, right? Um, how, do you pick, how do you pick what the topic is going to be of a documentary? Is it something that you're personally involved in or does, how, how do you get the ideas? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on my second documentary, and um, this documentary was something, it, it, this documentary is about returning with this new wave of veterans that are, that are coming home with uh, Iraq and uh, kind of dwindling down, and Afghanistan is going to slowly be dying down behind it. Um, veterans are going to start coming back in waves, right? And how do we deal with the huge amount of veterans that are going to come back? with post-traumatic stress disorder, with uh, you know, physical or just mental wounds. How do you deal with something like that, right? So as, as a veteran, that is kind of close to my heart. So it was something that kind of drove me. Uh, but the first documentary was about uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And it, was about a, uh, it was about a city trying to move past something that happened to them 90 years ago. And it would seem simple, but it's, it's, it's not as simple as it seems to do. Well, the original idea was you, you heard about an incident that happened in Tulsa and you became interested in that. And then you got to Tulsa. Right. And what did you find when you got to Tulsa? Uh, well, when I, I heard about, um, uh, it initially started that I kind of stumbled onto what was called the Tulsa Race Ride. And what was interesting about that is that, I mean, if you know anything about American history, race rides happen. They have happened. That doesn't 
that doesn't mean that they're not important, but it's an event that you can assume would, ha would have happened. But what was, what was interesting about it is the, the place that was destroyed was, a, was an area called Black Wall Street. And that particular area uh, in, 19, in the 1920s was home of the most affluent community of black people ever, right? So you had doctors, lawyers, uh, they created their own bank system because of seg segregation, so they were running banks. So this is, they es essentially created their own city and flourished because the, the money would circulate only there. It wouldn't go out to any other communities because they weren't allowed to go out in, into any other communities. So not knowing about that, and at that particular time already having a bachelor's degree, not knowing about Black Wall Street and the riot was, was, was something that kind of started the fire. And then when I started researching it, I realized it was, wasn't a lot of, there was information out there pretty much like you can find information on anything, but there was no real push to give that to people, right? And when I got to Tulsa, the original idea, again, was to talk about the riot, right? This is what happened, and you don't know about it. I'm, I'm a great guy giving you a bunch of information, right? But when I got there, I started to realize that it was more about a, a place that was kind of refusing to grow, right? And you had one side of town, which was still the black side of town now, and then you had the other side of town that was still the white side of town, relatively speaking. Um, that kind of refused to get past it, right? The, the black side of town was saying, in essence, you're not giving us our just due. We want you to kind of admit to it and do this sort of thing. And the white side of town is saying, look, we, we've officially apologized for it. We've set up uh, a community cultural center, you know, kind of, you know, we're, enough is enough, right? So it was really a story of, of two heads kind of butting together. And that's what, what the documentary ended up becoming. Tulsa, Oklahoma feels like a simple place. It seemed like a place I'd go to write a novel if I wrote. This city uh, is a uh, perfect uh, microism of the United States history. It uh, seems like everything that happened uh, in America happened in Tulsa just sped up. I arrived thinking I would tell the story of a city in a riot. I'm not asking you to hate your brother, but you have to learn the truth. And there are some ugly parts to the truth. Instead, I was told the story of a place that has become more complicated than I ever imagined. I still have trouble coming to grips with the magnitude of the destruction that took place. As a city, we've kind of said, Okay, we're done with that now. We, we, we've done our part. It, it's over. <laughs> they went 77 counties, and not one county voted for Obama. Wake up, America. Admit it, you still are a racist nation. If you look back from another perspective, this isn't necessarily just about Tulsa. This could be about the United States as a whole. What's been the response since the, the film came out? How was it received in Tulsa? Burn did really, really well. Um, pretty much everywhere. It won uh, Best Documentary at the uh, Hollywood Black Film Festival, won Best Documentary at the uh, Arizona Film Showcase, uh, won Audience Choice at three different film festivals. So it, it did really, really well. It's actually, it has a, it's played twice a month on the documentary channel. Excellent. And tell us about your current project, which is Under the Bourbon Moon. Under the Bourbon Moon is a uh, short, dramatic narrative uh, piece that I wrote um, probably a little less than a year ago. Um, it's about a group of friends that, that come together at a lake house and just kind of all the... Everything that's been building up is finally kind of comes to a head and it kind of explodes that weekend. So it's a, it's a really good piece. It's a really kind of a... As an actor, it's kind of a playground piece because you can just, you can take it and run with it and there's so many different things you can do with it because it's really about relationships and layers to the relationship and that sort of thing, so. What do I fear? I fear the noise. Another year, huh? Another year. Having to pretend to hear a rhythm in it. There's no rhyme or reason in it. It's just noise. He asked me to marry him. And I've grown tired of it. 
think you can take us through this woe is me bullshit year after year, but this year's different. I just want quiet. Hey, I don't know what you came here to do. Enough! People tell you you can't call out your own way You tell them to go to hell every day Yeah! Have a smile. Do you decide when you're making the film, like, I want to send this out to festivals or I want to distribute this myself? Or do you just make the film and see what you want to do with it when it's complete? Uh, I, I used to make the film <laughs> and see what I wanted to do with it when, uh, when it was over. I used to just, just get, get a film in hand and then you can come up with a game plan after mm -hmm. that. And that's really not the route you want to take. And I learned that probably after about my third film, that you, you really want to have a predetermined plan. Or, or strategic vision for what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. And the strategic vision for this particular film is to put together a body of work with the film that I did previously, the documentary, and now this film. I think as a body of work, that, that makes me tradable or marketable out there in, in the film community. So it, it was really important that this film be good mm -hmm. <laughs> so that these other elements can come together. But, um, yeah, that's the most important thing that I'm worried about with this film, is just making sure it fits in to kind of a narrative about me as a filmmaker to make me marketable and tradable out there. So where can we check out your films? Do you have a website, um, online presence that we can check out? Yeah, um, you can, pretty much the usual places, the Twitters, your Facebooks, Instagram. Um, you can get all the information you need out there on me. Uh, if you Google me, you'll find the places to buy okay. all my films and, and pretty much... Uh, Anything you want to know about me is out there for you. <laughs> Stalkers beware. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for uh, being with us this afternoon. No, no, I appreciate it. Me. It's great. It was great to be here. Thank you. For Indie Capital, I'm Pamela Nash, and this is Harold Jackson the Third. <laughs>